I'm, I'm saying I'm blessed when I, I've grown up with a lot of talented people who've gone on to do a lot of really good things. Uh, Dr. Carmen Brown Warren uh, was, I, I knew her since high school. She was a debater right. for Science Park High School when it was called Science High School. When it was Science High School. Right. And she went on to become a doctor. And not just any doctor. She works at a uh, former UNDMJ. Uh, she works at Rutgers, Rutgers Hospital. Mm -hmm. University Hospital. University mm -hmm. Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know how they changed I it, know, right? Yeah. They, right. Yeah. So she works at University Hospital and the emergency room. So she's an emergency room doctor. Uh, which is like one of the, I think, one of the most stressful types of medicine because she doesn't know from day to day whether she's going to get uh, like, you know, a sore throat or a gunshot wound, yeah. right? Yeah. And can get them all in the same day. And she not only is an emergency room doctor, she teaches other doctors how to become emergency room doctors. So we have a lot of, I, I've seen a lot of people, you know, write books. I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, growing up in Newark or growing up other places and becoming doctors. And I'm like, yes, I, I know one who's a, a doctor who's from Newark, who, who grew up here and does a lot of uh, does a lot of really good work. So welcome here, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wong. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. I am extremely happy to be here, especially with Jati. You know why I'm happy to be here, because it's you. Oh, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad because it's like mutual admirations because of all the all the great work uh, that you do. Now, it wasn't easy or was it easy? Did it just come easy? You just always were like, hey, I went to science. I'm in science. I'll become a doctor. Was it just like that easy? No, I would actually say when I was at Science High, I want to do engineering. Okay. And that's actually what I left Science High School with the plan to become an electrical engineer, which I was. I went to Tuskegee University in Alabama. A little different, away, out of, out of Newark, totally different from Newark, from the urban streets of Newark to the rural streets of, uh, of uh, Tuskegee. So it definitely was a little different. Um, I would say um, I loved engineering and it was challenging. The academic part of it was challenging. And then um, coming out and working in corporate world was a little challenging. But I think. So you didn't go right to med school? No, oh no. No, no, I did um, engineering. I worked as an engineer for about three, four years. Wow. Yeah, I worked in uh, corporate America. So you worked at a, what kind of engineer were you? Electrical. And so you had projects, you were doing different science stuff in terms of putting stuff together. Yeah. So um, when I first came out, I worked for Xerox in Rochester, New York. And it was like a managerial program, which we rotated in all the different areas of Xerox just to understand the company and the business. And then I, I guess the last time or the last rotation I did was manufacturing. So I was part of the plant floor in which they built the actual hockey machines. And then from there, I decided, you know what? I can't, I can't live up here in Rochester. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's, just, it's just not the place for a 22-year-old just graduated from college, not married, no kids. So it's just family town. It's a great town. So I moved to Michigan where I had family and I started working for Xerox and at the V8 engine plant. Oh, in, in Michigan. In Michigan. Okay. And I worked in... Uh, so V8 like, engines. V8 engines. We built the V8 engines for General Motors. And I was responsible for the um, computers that worked the line for making sure that the logic was... was and then you said you worked in Flint? And I worked in Flint, Michigan. Okay. And that's relevant to what we were talking yeah. about. In Earlier terms of, today when you're talking about the lead in the water. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And infrastructure problems that exist all over this country. It right. sure does. But Flint, Flint reminds me of North. It wasn't much different. In terms of a, an, and an industrial city? Industrial city, environment, the poverty, it was pretty much like North. So what made you move from there? Well, I felt like engineering was not for me. My calling was to work with people. I love people. And so um, from med school, I decided, I mean, from undergraduate school, I had already decided I wanted to go to uh, medical school. But I didn't want to be a professional student forever. Oh, wow. So in other words, you already knew you wanted to go to med school, but you just worked first. But I just worked first. And I think that's good for people to know, right? Like, yeah. you don't just, uh, like, you, you, although you were pre-med, you were an engineering major. Mm -hmm. um, I was never pre-med in college. Oh, wait. I was so you were only engineering. So you were only engineering. So when I got out, I had to take the courses required to get into med school. So, oh, this is great because a lot of people think that if you don't decide to become a doctor early, then you won't be able to become a doctor. Absolutely not. And one of the things I tell people all the time, you don't have to major in biomedical, this, that, and to become a physician. You just need to take the required courses so you can do well on the MCAT because you're going to get all the courses in med school. Hmm. And so engineering, I wasn't a biomedical engineer. I was electrical, which was totally different. 
Um, and I just took whatever courses I needed once I graduated. So once you graduated, you took additional courses. So you took biology, physics? I took biology. I had all the physics already because I took one, two, and three in undergrad. But I had to take biochemistry, biology, one and two, organic chemistry, organic chemistry, one and two, all the required courses to do well on the MCAT. And so you, so you're, are you, are you doing that at the same time you're working? I'm doing that at the same time I'm working. I'm doing that at nighttime at University of Michigan. Wow. So you were, so you were just taking one-off courses basically to prepare for the MCATs. What are the MCATs for so people the, who might not know? The MCATs are um, a standardized test, which actually no matter what profession you're in, it's standardized testing never goes away, mm. right? So the MCAT is an actual standardized test that requires you to do well so they can see that you can handle the rigor of a medical school environment. Okay. And so you go to, med so tell me about that. Like you apply to med school. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you would tell the audience about applying to med school? So I would say, uh, first of all, let me just say, it is challenging when you're taking those um, courses to get into med school. Um, and so I think for the first time in my life, I realized that, you know, studying for med school and studying the biology is a little bit different than electrical engineering. So you must have to have, you have to have your mindset ready for what you're about to embark when you get into med school. So when I applied to med school, I applied to all different everywhere. You no, know anyone that would take me. And I decided that I wanted to come back to New Jersey. And so when I um, was accepted into Rutgers Medical School, I came all the way back to New Jersey because I was in Michigan at the time. And I decided, mm, yep, this is it for me. This is where I'm going to go. And so I decided to attend Robert Wood Johnson med Medical School. And it was totally okay. different, totally different. So talk, talk about the medical school experience. Um, some people say medical school is so incredibly difficult. Uh, so many people are discouraged. They don't think they would be able to become a doctor. What was your experience like? Like you is it, is it because you were naturally good at math? Is it just because, or not naturally good at the sciences? Did you have to work really hard? Is it both? Uh, what were the experience like? You know, it, when people say medical school is hard, I, I agree. And, and it's hard because it requires a lot of effort, a lot of study time. So when you think about when you're an undergraduate, you probably have like this amount of information to learn. Um, we learned that amount of information in the first three or four weeks. So the amount of information for a class is this amount. So I would say when I first started medical school, uh, it was very challenging. So in other words, what you're saying is that the amount of information that you have to know in a semester, you have to know in the first two. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. absolutely. I remember taking biochem thinking, oh, I took biochem. This should be good. Yeah. Everything I learned in undergrad was the first two weeks in um, medical school. Wow. Literally. So I would say it's challenging in that sense, right? You have to learn how to study. It's about memorization. And that's one of the things with engineering. Engineering is not necessarily memorization. Engineering is deriving, understanding. And so that and once you master understanding that it's just memorization, trying to get through that amount of information, that's the challenging part about it. So med school is, you have to like become one with the Google. Yeah. Right? As in you have to become Google yourself. You are. On that too. medical it's information. so much information. I tell you, that's, that's probably the most challenging part, the amount of information not the information itself. I think it's the amount. So actually just learning that much new information in a short amount of time. Yes. What are some of the things that you use yes. to help help you with that? Like what are some tips that, that you, you give? So um, I guess one of the things coming from a historical black university um, undergrad is that I look, I utilize and learn how to use my, my professors, my classmates, and we actually had study groups all the time. I mean, I study seven days a week, probably, and that's where everybody doesn't necessarily have to do that, but I did. And I utilized my professors. When I understand, I went to them. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, I don't understand what I'm doing. So um, using your professors becomes really, really important. Definitely. And then utilizing your, co your classmates so that they also have a little breadth of information more than you. And, you know, when you get together, you have something they don't have. They have something you don't have. And together, you guys have it. Everything. And so what I did was I utilized those two techniques to make sure that I was on top of my work. So you created a network, a necessary network of people around you. A lot Absolutely. Of people, a lot of people think they, have, they can do it by themselves. No, we can't. And I, and I encourage students to really do that from the jump street. Once you get comfortable going to your professor, that's the way to the, to, to the end of, the, of success is making sure that they know what you know what they want from you. Okay, so a lot of times it's, Understand to understand the information, 
you have to understand who is giving the information Absolutely. and what they actually want you to conclude from the information. Yeah, and, that, and then you know what, John? That's just not school <laughs> that's actually life right mm. and that's a that's something that i think a lot of us need to understand that it's not just from your professor it's from your job it's from your supervisor it's uh, your relationship section unless you understand what that person wants from you nothing is going to do with that. Mm. and that that i think that is an important key that most people don't really understand because we're not trained for that we, we're, we're not we're trained to think of ourselves as individuals and we, we sink or swim on our own Mm -hmm. the, you know, on our own individual efforts, mm -hmm. when that's just not the way the world works. I would say uh, I'm attending a historical black university really instilled that in me. Like, I, I had the home numbers of my professors. Mm -hmm. I could literally call them at home and say, hey, I, I have no idea how to make this um, circuit work. I'm totally confused. I could go to their houses. I mean, we utilized each other like we were brother and sister. It wasn't that cat fight. I want to bring you down. I want to bring me up. It was let's all work together so we all can like you know. It's the reason why historically black colleges tend to train more doctors mm -hmm. than anybody else, more yeah. black doctors than anybody else. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, so after you after you you, you work really hard, you you uh, what was the breakthrough in med school? Like, what was the place? Like, what was the point of med school when you were like, I got this? Mm, I don't even know if there was a point where I said, <laughs> <laughs> I could say I got this. I don't know. I would. Mean, but I will say that probably by fourth year, because I'm one thing about med school is you go in there and you're like, oh, I want to do GYN, I want to do ortho, I want to do, you know, you have really an idea about what you want to do until you get exposed to like everything. You're kind of still in the wilderness. And I would say that once I had the opportunity to um, to do um, emergency medicine is when I got the happiness and the, I guess, peace to say, you know what, I'm doing everything. I get a piece of psych, I get a piece of a lot of medicine, I get a piece of orthopedics, I get a piece of surgery, mm. and they're all into one. And I think at that point, when I made that decision that this is what I want to do, was probably when I was like, okay, this is it. So that was in your fourth year of med school, you felt comfortable and you thought that you'd want to do like emergency room medicine? Yes, definitely. Well, when I, went, when I started med school, I wanted to do GYN okay. because I had a GYN mentor. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to deliver babies. And then from then I said, I'm going to do orthopedics because I like the gadgetry and the sewing and the surgery. But um, or emergency medicine lets you do it all. And okay. I think that's what really made me happy. So you're, you are currently an emergency room doctor at University uh, Hospital in Northern Virginia. Um, and that seems like it would be a, a very, and you've been doing this for many, many years. Yes, right? 15 Wow. Okay. So you've been doing this for 15 years and you actually teach uh, emergency room doctors how to do it. Yeah. So, so, I mean, one of the things about um, Rutgers and, and that's who employs me is that um, we are academic medicine. So part of academic medicine is that we actually train residents, medical students and get them ready so that, you know, they're able to be a specialist in their, in whatever area they choose. So I have emergency medicine residents that are under me. From four years, they are trained so they can become out, come out and become great physicians in emergency medicine. Cool. So, so you actually, you're actually training the next generation of emergency uh, room doctors. Yes, and I'm hoping that I'm training them to not just know the medicine, but to understand the patient. I think that's the key, key thing, and what we need to raise for our future generation physicians. What are some of the most memorable moments that you had? Mm. Like just you know, like I mean, you see so much what are some of the things that like just a day in the life of a particular day that you remember mm -hmm. you know, like, i would wow. say you know that that's a that's a good question that i get asked that all the time and i say i think you know when i leave in order for me to function at outside i almost kind of block whatever happened you know during that day um yeah, that's gonna be one of my other questions too, yeah because, i, I yeah. have to i don't even think i tell my husband half the time I, I'm, I see so many people being from Newark. I see a lot of people that I know or that he knows. And I don't even remember to tell when I leave, like, oh, I saw so-and-so. Like, it, it's just it's just so much. I think it's overload every day. And the only way to function is to kind of, when I leave there, to be like, I'm done. I'm done. And so you actually erase the stuff I, that you I mean, do. Pretty much I do. <laughs> but I would say that, hmm, I mean, I think in my early years, I was more affected um, by... Uh, those patients that you, you're talking to every day, hey, I mean, that I have a conversation with. 
and by the end of my shift, I'm pronouncing them. Those, those are probably the most memorable patients. And I attend like their funerals or their wakes I try to go to. So those are the ones that probably make, make the most impression. Do you still do that now? Do you attend yeah. the funerals and wakes? Over? Not all of them. Not as much as I did when I first started. But yeah, I definitely try to. Yeah. Especially if I have a connection with like the family or um, with the patient. Um, I still cry. I still go out mm, to the wake, ambulance bay, cry suck it up and then come back in and try to take care of the rest of the patients. You still have to have some sense of like humility and um, empathy for the patients that we take care of. Right. And, and, and that's, that, that was going along with what I was going to ask about as well, because like, you know, as a, as a teacher, you know, you deal with the emotional stresses of kids. Uh, you deal with certain, their, some of their certain traumas. And I know I'm seeing, there are times when I'm self-medicating in the bar, know, right? Like I I'm like, you know, or at, at a home with a exactly. nice, Stash exactly. of tequila. I'm not really saying yeah. that on there, but yeah. the but no. in terms of there's emotional toll that that's taken, and I always talk about self care, seeing a therapist, doing getting massage, right? Deep body tissue massage, right? Well, wellness is big, right? Especially in medicine, emergency medicine carries one of the highest suicide rates amongst no, oh, yeah. what amongst, amongst physicians, and the reason why is just because of what we see and what we do every day. I mean, it's extremely stressful. I don't know what's coming through the door. I don't know what the next patient is. I don't know if I'm going to talk to you right now and then the next minute you're going to be unconscious. It's it's just very stressful every single day. So it's important and it's actually emphasized a lot for us to have a life outside of medicine and to make sure that you are finding ways to release any of that stress because the buildup of it is not healthy. So they're, they're, so you would definitely recommend that for, and you do recommend that for Absolutely. the people that you train. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's a big thing that we do with our residents is make sure that there's an wellness uh, component to their training. What are some of the things that you tell them to do for wellness? Because I think that everyone could actually benefit from that. Yeah. You know, so for me, I found that what makes me happy is finding something outside of here, these four walls in this hospital that keeps me excited. And what keeps me excited is being involved in the community in a way that I can give back. And, and you have to find what it is for you that makes you happy. So, and it can't be these four walls of the university hospital. Right. It's got to be outside of here. It doesn't mean that you're leaving and going skiing on the next weekend. Or does it mean that you're getting a massage every other week? I mean, something that's got to bring the endorphins of happiness back into your life. And for me, I love it. It, it means giving back to the community in whichever way that I can. So I'm from Newark. I'm here in Newark. And so any way that I can get involved with giving back to my community, I do. And that, that keeps me. I, I like that you actually put it in a medical way. You're like, it's about the endorphins. <laughs> <laughs> it's about bringing those endorphins in. <laughs> and, and so like doing those things that actually bring you happiness. Yeah. Uh, and making sure you put those in your life. Absolutely. On a very consistent basis. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you go in the community, what are some of the things that you do? So I do a lot of speaking in the community with at schools and also at different um, church programs where they have actually have people speaking about STEM careers. Um, I actually started a charter school in Newark. So really? Yeah. What what school? <laughs> Great Oaks Legacy Charter School. You're you're responsible for Great Oaks Legacy yeah, Charter School. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. <laughs> it was about three of us a, about eight and a half years ago. Really? Walking, walking the streets of Newark asking students. Don't you want to come to our charter school? Don't you want to come to our charter school? And now we have graduated three classes, and we have a 98% college rate. Wait, I had no idea. It was you and two other people in Great Oaks? Yes, yes. And now we have, obviously, a board. Uh, What's Great Oaks Legacy? Because we combine right. with Legacy School. But, um, yeah, we, oh, okay. we, it's great. It's, it's awesome. Any way that I feel, because one of the things that I think that can change generations is education. Right. And... Um, any way we can get in at the education from the bottom, move it up, that's how we do it. And we put an emphasis is we want you to go to college. We want you to do well, but we want you to come back to Newark because that's what it's about, right. the next generation, so we can do the same thing. Okay. I, see, I, all, you learn something new every day because, <laughs> like, I had no idea. And the, uh, and oh, do you guys have a debate team? We are we actually we actually are starting a debate team and you know I want them to have a debate team so yes, yes, without yes. a doubt, without a doubt. Good, good, Absolutely. Good. So so the uh, so what are some of the other things that you that you do within the community? Because I know that you are like just the best role model. Like when you come in and you're like, Hey, my name is 
you know, Carl Brown Warren, and I'm an emergency room doctor. And everybody thinks like all the television shows where the emergency room doctors, like you're like Grey's Anatomy, but real. It's right? so funny because I do, when I do talk to students and I have like this PowerPoint presentation and I show pictures of these shows, like kids get all excited. And then at the end, I'm like, yeah, but it, it's not like that. It's, it's not, not like that, that at all. Yeah, uh -huh. no, those are so proper. But you described it like that. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I wish it was like that, but it's so not like that. But I mean, I would say anything that is reflective of what we do on a regular basis are you can see on like some life in the ER okay. or real stories in the ER. Those are kind of really bread and butter type ERs. That other stuff is just fluff. <laughs> so in other words, the reality shows that talk about like, here's life in the ER. Yeah, yeah. And which is, which does seem like the it's- Resident, you know, great. And now I mean, they're they are not real. Not at all. Not I, I, in fact, I used to watch shows and I was like, what are you doing? You can't do that. That's not your role, you know? I like, <laughs> so I stopped watching those. Wait, things. wait, you're telling me you actually, wa you watch them after you are an experienced emergency yeah, room doctor. Yeah, analyzing and it's just not good. Yeah, because it's, it's like, good. BS, BS. I yeah, call yeah, BS, no, right, right. Like the resident is doing everything. I'm like, no. He can be in surgery and the ER, and he's like, that's not true. But I do, I try to get involved with, um, I'm involved with a lot of organizations too, to uh, make sure that we do a lot of community service as well. Um, with the Links Incorporated, um, vice president currently of our um, Essex County chapter. Um, and we just do a lot of things in the community as well, education. Um, we also, I'm also with Delta Sigma Theta. We also Delta, like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we like to <laughs> okay, do, we like way to, to represent. Do, um, Again, importance is giving back. And right. if, if I'm if I'm gonna be in an organization, it has to be about what am I doing for the next man? I feel like we're here on this earth and, and our purpose is to serve others. So my service is through obviously medicine, but also whatever I can give to my fellow man is what I'm here for. Now, working in the emergency room, um, you do see a lot of stuff. I know you put like mm -hmm. most of it out, right? Mm -hmm. But what is it that you learn from the emergency room that like becomes a thing about that might be greater. Like what what are the lessons that you learn from seeing everyone there, right? Like uh, and because like, as for teaching, right? For teaching and coaching, I have a philosophy about life that I developed through teaching and coaching. The things that you see that teach you about like life because you're there and you yeah. just you get it. Yeah. Is there something like in working in the med in, in the emergency room? Uh, seeing people every single day, uh, working, training people to be in the emergency room every single day. What are some of the things that you think are these larger life lessons that you get from just doing your job? That's a good question. I think I would say um, what's been most influential in my life and in the job that I've done is meeting these new people every day that are at the worst point of their life and being able to handle the stress with those, with those patients and um, being able to teach the new physicians how to handle that same stress, right? You're talking about a patient who can't see their doctor because they're working two jobs and the doctor's office closes at five o'clock and I can only come here and I wait nine hours in the waiting room or eight hours in the waiting room and then I finally see you and I'm angry. So learning how to deal with a patient that has other stresses that you don't think that it's just the, oh, I'm coming here to get, you know, taken care of. Well, guess what? I didn't sleep last night. I didn't eat last night because I didn't have enough food, but only enough for my children. And that's why my sugar is crazy because I can only afford the worst case, the worst meals, the worst foods. And understanding the patient that we have and um, learning to to deal with them, not just medically, because everybody's just not a book and a symptom, but also understanding the components that make the patient that we have. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's interesting because you're like, don't just look at them medically, yeah. look at the other components Absolutely. that make them like that, that might be like having empathy. I mean, you have to, I mean, I think you can lose it because like, say for example, in our trauma, I see gunshot wound, pun gunshot wound, stab wound, assault constantly. But if I don't take the time to be like, listen dude, what, did I take care of you like a few months ago? What, what, what's going on? Like, why are you here again? Like, what is happening? So, I mean, just having, being able to relate and talk with our patients beyond the, okay, this is it, this is what you're, 
imagine. Now, do you think, and this becomes a question, uh, like in debate, we often debate about like medical apartheid, we debate about, you know, like the, uh, the we're always reading these studies about uh, medicine and how black people are treated one way, uh, mm -hmm. that they don't really necessarily recognize that we have pain. Yeah. Um, when you are training people, uh, how do you have those conversations? It's really, you have a great deal of empathy. You're from North, you really feel in terms of what, like what you do. And you are teaching others to deal with people within our community. Um, how do you approach the topic of race, racism, empathy, and, uh, and how to deal with individuals? I think, I think, first of all, we have residents that are hailing from all different areas, Midwest, to the far, far west, to inner city, to the most country, maybe not even have been around um, uh, different races, different cultures. And so being in North forces them to have to develop the type of empathy for a patient that's needed, right? So when I tell you that, it doesn't mean much, but when you're thrown into an environment where you have no choice, it actually makes the resident and actually helps them to get, to get to the point where they should be developing a certain amount of empathy for the patient. And then by example, so you see the lady cuss me out, tell me she's going to, you know, sue me. And I'm like, okay, ma'am, no problem. Bless you. Have a good day. But you see me not reacting the mm -hmm. way that somebody else would be reacting. So it has to be by example. And then also by throwing them into the fire. Right? I was going to say that you know when you're thrown into the fire you have a choice yeah and that choice can do. be either empathy or a lot of it so now i'll say I that, that that's not everybody everybody can't do it right. you can't you can't teach it right it's either got to be in there we pull it out or you don't have it and and um i will say the percentage of residents that i see come through university hospitals very very small that don't have it okay. you don't choose this career that puts you in an environment under stress at patients at their worst, if you can't understand some empathy. Cool, and, and that's great to know, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think it's also important that the, the whole example, thing. Yeah. because I think that if there, if there's someone else who has a different understanding of how to deal with patients and they're leading, yeah. right? I think that leadership means something. Uh, so it's one of those things where like, thank you for showing and demonstrating such leadership uh, yeah, gotcha. for us as well. You too. <laughs> yeah, I know, but very different fields, very different fields. Very different but, fields, but um, I, I always say, you know, I think everybody is in their gift and they're calling where they should be, right? And that's right. how you, that's why you excel. Mine is not better than yours. Yours is not better than mine. It's just different. Fair, but there are certain life and death things that, like, I appreciate you doing what you're doing. Thank you. Because I know that there is, there aren't many communities that are blessed to have someone like you well, like, at the center. I thank God. So well, well, we have we do have another question for you. We are, we're getting ready to wrap up, okay. uh, but we do have a question that we ask everyone. And except for Jesse Jackson, we forgot. <laughs> he was on twice. We forgot to ask him twice. Uh, and that is, uh, who is your favorite hip hop artist, individual or group? Uh... Tribe, Tribe Called Quest. Tribe Called Quest? Yeah. All right, that's good. That's, that's, all, good. that's, on, my, that's on my playlist. And I was jamming when I first, when, you know, when you first got you, yeah, hey, you know, I was <laughs> singing a little bit back up in there with the, everybody getting my little hip hop on. I was just like, wait, relax. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right here at the gym. Like, You're yeah. like, I'm getting my endorphins yes. on. <laughs> yes. But Tribe, I would definitely say Tribe. All right, cool. So. Thank you uh, so much. We'll have to have you back because please, there's a lot more that please. we want to have in terms of your discussions. Uh, and definitely, is again, appreciate the work that you do. Uh, always been wanting to try to get you up here for a while. You Glad have, you but did. you know what, Jonathan? I just have to say thank you. Jonathan was, what, two years ahead of me? I think so. I think so. And he was definitely a, a role model, a leader. Um, I, was, I was definitely in debate, but I was still kind of, you know, pushed pushed by the streets a little bit. So I have to say that Jonathan has always kept the narrow straight and keep the course and kept it kept it good. So thank you so much for you, Jonathan, and for all of those that were ahead of me like you. That, that kept me where I was today. Well thank you. Definitely. I love I love this guy. <laughs> well thank you. Very much appreciated. Very much appreciated. Mutual love, love and love back. So uh gotta have you back on here again. Thank you again.
All right, so DJ Rhino, this is All Politics on Local America's number one, number one, number one political hip-hop radio talk show. DJ Rhino, you do your thing, uh, and we'll be back uh, because the good councilwoman Donna Williams is in Martha's Vineyard, and when she calls in, she's going to teach me something about Martha's Vineyard because I've never been, and I was like, you going to Martha's Vineyard? No. I don't know, man. I'm just, you know, I'm I'm from Newark, and you know, just uh, I'm just staying here, and I'm just I didn't even know, you know, I didn't know about Jack and Jill until I was in college. <laughs> so, no, I didn't know about Jack and Jill until I was in college either. So I do, right? I do, yeah. Right, right. That's the Newark experience. We find out about that stuff in college, yeah. right? And we're like, what's that? So Martha's Vineyard. I'm like, I, you know, I was like, Martha's yes. Martha's Vineyard is the black mecca for the month of August. If you ever get up to Martha's Vineyard, you have to go in August. That's August is where, when black people go. All the black people. I mean, you can roam the whole island and you see nothing but black people. Nice. Because really, it's, they were like, she's like, the Obamas are up here. Absolutely. She's like, like, she was like, everybody who's somebody is everybody, up here. Everybody who's, right. who, who, you don't even have to be somebody. Just, you just need to know about Martha's Vineyard Martha's and Vineyard. get up and because there are all these conferences and people yes. talking. Oh, and, and they have a lot of political uh, workshops. They have a lot of uh, politicians that come up and speak and they have little, um, I guess, coffee clutches for them as well. But it's also organizations. They have fundraisers. I mean, it's just constant. Cool. So DJ Rhino, we're going to be back.